In this session we're going to be looking at a very peculiar hiding place um, and that is the, the, when death itself becomes the hiding place. Now please don't be put off by that, it will make perfect sense. Death for the believer is no tragedy, it's glorious and we have to change the way that we think. The Victorians never talked about sex, but they talked an awful lot about death. We never talk about death, but we talk an awful lot about sex. Okay. Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me, and you have known me. You have known me. God has done a full data readout on every one of us beyond the subatomic level, in body, soul and spirit, in thought, word and deed, God has a surveillance system powered by the Holy Spirit himself. And there's nothing that's coming in the future that can hold up a candle to, to God's surveillance system. It's important that we know that. There is nowhere to hide from God. So he says, you have searched me, and you have known me, you know my sitting down, you know my rising up, you understand my thoughts from afar, you comprehend my path and my lying down, you are acquainted with all my ways, with all my habits, Lord, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus knows what's in our heart and he knows what's going to come past our lips. You have hedged me behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. David bursts into adoration. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. We expect God to be with us on the mountains. Of course he's with us. Praise the Lord, God is good, we say. Praise the Lord, God is good. But he says, if I make my bed in hell, behold, wow, behold, wow, you're even there. And that's what Carrie, when she left the death camps, Ravensbrook, she went around the world with one message, that there is not a pit that's deep and dark enough where God's love can't go further. That was what she went around the world telling people. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take on the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, and thank God Jesus promises every missionary, those that go across the farthest parts of the sea, promises them, I am with you always. Even there your hand will, shall lead me, your right hand shall grasp me, fast and seize me. Jesus says, no one will pluck them from my hand. If I say, surely the darkness shall batter me, crush me, fall on me, even the night shall be light around me. And indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. This verse just knocked me out the first time I looked at this in Scotland. Even the darkness, friends, is a light to God. It might not be light to us. We, we would probably see it as darkness, you understand. We'll see it and think, oh, this is terrible. But from God's perspective, it's, he sees everything. Every little thing. And he's going to get you through. There's nothing that God will put you through that he won't get you through. Okay, we're going to move on. This morning, like I say, we're going to talk about, again, this massive subject of hiding places. We're talking about persecution. So in persecution, there's kind of three hiding places. There are physical hiding places. We'll deal with that first. Physical hiding places. Remember the film, Kari Ten Boom, when they hid the Jewish people? There are physical hiding places. Secondly, when the physical hiding places go, and there are no longer any, you must be hidden in God. And then finally, when death itself becomes a hiding place. That's what we're going to be looking at, okay? So let's begin at Matthew chapter 24 very quickly, and let's look at this. Matthew chapter 24. I love that Jesus gives us this beautiful overview. It's not complicated, it's clear, it's concise, it's beautiful. This is what Jesus says, Take heed that no one deceives you, verse 4. 
For many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will deceive many. That's going to happen. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See to it that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Nation or ethnos will rise against ethnos. Ethnicities against one another. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines. There will be pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs. They're just the beginning. And between each birth pang you'll get a rest. I asked somebody this week, I can't remember who it was now, what's it like when you're going through the birth pangs and you get to have the rest and they just simply said, you just say thank God for the rest. <laughs> All these are the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations. What? Not one nation, all nations, for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, and will betray one another, and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of the many will grow cold. So this is important. Talking about birth pangs, there comes a point where persecution begins, verse 9. They will deliver you up to tribulation. And as we look in the Bible, Jesus makes it very clear who you can expect the they to be. And it's quite shocking, but we just have to accept it. Jesus says it, so we have to accept it. As shocking as it is, very often it's your own brother, it's your own sister that start this thing off. Now Jesus says here... The love of many will wax cold. We sang about it this morning. Your love has melted me. Your love has melted me. But there's coming a time when lawlessness will abide. We've been talking this week about the, 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 the amount of scamming that's going on on the internet. People, people are stealing money left, right and centre. In the last five years, it's increased massively. Yet nobody dare buy things on the internet anymore in case they feel they're going to be scammed. Lawlessness is increasing exponentially. This last five years, it's gone through the roof. As lawlessness increases, the love of the many will wax cold. Now, listen, a, 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 a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. It's only as strong as its weakest link. And in our character, in our character, when we get into those times, the part in our character that's weakest now will be the point that the chain snaps at in us. It's not going to snap in the strongest place. It's going to snap in the weakest place. Now what we do as Christians is we say we, be, we believe the word of God. Well, we do believe the word of God. But what we tend to do is we have our favourite bits. We have the bits that we call the Word of God and we put a big emphasis on one bit. Just one bit. Very often that's what it is. We look at other bits but there's one particular bit that we really have. For some it's faith. For some it's serving. For some it's the gospel. For some it's prophet. Everybody has a thing. But here's the thing that we have to get. We are only as strong as the weakest link in us. And so, friends, what we have to do now is level up in every area in the Word. Not just in the parts that we like, that tickle our ears. We've got to level up in the areas that we're weak in. So if we're weak in the area of unforgiveness, now is the time. Now is the time. Because if we don't level up in this area, we're only as strong as the weakest link inside of us. If we're, if we're weak in the area of love, now is the time to level up. Jesus commands us to love one another. Yes, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult to love somebody that's really hurt you. But this is the time to level up, friends. Not just in the area that we hold as the Word of God, but all of the Word of God. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word. We have to level up. This is the time. We won't get this time when things start to change. Now is the time. Look at Corrie Ten Boom and her family. Look very carefully at what they were before the persecution came. Look at them. They were innocent people. You notice that? Very like, childlike faith. But they loved the enemies. Did you notice that they loved the enemies? They cared for the salvation of the Nazis. That's important that we understand that. Do you understand that they took the word of God and they just took it for what it was? They believed all of it? These things are important. 
what we are now determines what we're going to be. So we have to level up. You are only as strong as your weakest link. Don't look at somebody else as the weakest link. Understand that, that we are, all of us are a series of links within ourself. And it's the weakest part of our character that will snap when the shaking begins. Where do earthquakes um, happen on this planet? Where the fault lines are. They always crack on the fault lines. It's always the same. The word sincere means to be without wax. They used to take a vessel and where the cracks are in the vessel, they'd fill them with wax and paint over them. Uh, you knock that vessel, where's it going to crack? It's going to crack where the cracks are. We are only as strong as our weakest links. So we have to make sure in this time that in our weakest areas we say, Search me, O Lord. Search me, O Lord. And see if there be something in me that needs an upgrade quickly. And I think that goes for all of us. Okay, so it's difficult. It's difficult because Jesus warns us it's going to be your brothers and sisters, and that's, that is a hard pill to swallow. Have a look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. We're going to whiz through some scriptures this morning. John 16 verse... Well, just John 16 verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he is... Uh, he offers God a service. Now that is just beyond, uh, uh, you can't believe that that would be the case, but it, it will be the case. They, they will honestly think that they're doing God a favour by, by killing you. There are people like that today. I'm not on about physically killing, but there are people that actually think they're doing God a favour by utterly battering you. Uh, it's crazy. This is a, folks, we're in this now. We've taken the red pill and we have to just... We have to just accept we are on this journey and the Lord will see us through. Amen. He'll see us through. So I'm going to show you something. It's one of the most complex parts of David's life where he goes from one physical hiding place to another, to another, to another. I want you to see how difficult it is. You see, people get this romantic view of the end times. They, they've read too many of the Left Behind books. And they kind of think, oh, it's going to be romantic and wonderful and people are good. This is, no, it's not going to be that way. We need to look at 1 Samuel chapter 21. Look at the life of David and it will give you an understanding of what it will be like to, to go from one physical hiding place to another. It's not easy. We, friends, I'm talking to all of you, you have to be very careful who, who you entrust your life to. Now at this point in 1 Samuel 21, David had slain Goliath. Now in the flesh, you would think that David deserves a reward for that. Have you ever done something wonderful for the Lord and sort of subconsciously you think you deserve a pat on the back? <laughs> but what comes is actually persecution and you think, where on earth did that come from? I didn't see that coming. Because subconsciously, that's what we think. We grew up, my parents told us, do something nice, you get a pat on the back. Then you get saved, you do something nice, you get a wallop round the head. You think, I don't get it. Well, it's all changed. Well, David slayed Goliath, and you would think that it would be wonderful, but it was the exact opposite. Saul begins to get very paranoid. Uh, the anointing leaves him. Saul is not a prayer. Have you noticed he's not a praying man? David is a praying man. Saul is not. He just presumes everything and jumps in and... Oh, uh, so David is, is now on the run because he's, <laughs> Jonathan, is, look, David, he's after you, he's going to kill you, he can So off he goes. Now David goes to the most obvious place here, he goes to the sanctuary. If, if there's ever going to be a place where you're going to be safe, in David's mind, it's the sanctuary, right? So he goes to the sanctuary and there's a wonderful priest in there called Ahimelech, lovely guy. Um, and Ahimelech asks him in, in verse 1, like, what are you doing here? Why are you on your own? Uh, because David and Saul for a time were, you know, glued together and, you know, it just... <sighs> Ahimelech knew there was something wrong. And I think by this point, rumours would have been circulating around Israel that there's something happening between David and Saul. And people were sort of picking up that, that something's not right. 
And Ahimelech was kind of, why are you on your own? What's the crack here? Now David lies. David actually lies here. And you might think to yourself, well, I would never do that. <laughs> well, you see, what happens is when you're in persecution, you're shaken. Your character is tested to the core. And you, friends, the church, I'm talking about the true church, the remnant, they will make mistakes. They're going to make mistakes. Because that's what happens when you get shaken. You make mistakes. It, it brings out the real person. And David... Like, now I believe he lies for a reason. He says he's on a top secret mission sent by Saul. Well, he's not. He's running for his life. He could have easily said to Ahimelech, Ahimelech, please help me. I know you're a godly man. I'm running for my life away from Saul. I have no intention of fighting him. I'm running from him. But he doesn't, and there's a reason why he doesn't. We'll look at that in a minute. There's somebody else in this sanctuary. And because of this other person in that sanctuary... He knew he couldn't tell the truth. And it's very difficult, isn't it? What happens if you get arrested and you're, you're, you're asked to expose where people are hiding? Do you tell the truth? Do you see what I mean? There are so many grey areas when it comes to persecution. Okay, so that's the situation. Now, David says, look, I'm here on the top secret mission sent by Saul. Give me bread. I need bread. He knew that the only bread in there was the holy bread. But it's basically saying, he would, listen, he was basically saying, you have got to have compassion upon me. I'm in a dire situation. And friends, sometimes we get so legalistic, the, the letter of the law becomes the all, and we can't see the need. And David had this, he really had a need here. In fact, Jesus talks about this in the Gospels, this very incident. As we go into these times, it's already happening. Has everybody noticed that banks are shutting everywhere? Have you noticed it's harder and harder to, to, to put cash into the banks? That's because they're going to rid... The, the, within only a few years, there will be no cash at all. Everything's going to be centralised, digitised, and it won't be Barclays or Lloyds Bank or this thing or the other. It will be centralised to the Bank of England. Everything will be centralised. Every debit, every credit, everything that you spend your money on is going to be monitored and programmable. Now, what programmable means is this. There's going to come a time where you might have a lot of money, digital money in the bank, but you might not necessarily be able to spend it because if you have a low credit rating with the government, they'll stop you from spending it on certain things like travel and so on. It's, the model's already there in China and the world is taking this model on. So this is a precursor to the mark of the beast. But the good news is this, it will not stop the Christian because although the currency of this world is buying and selling, the kingdom of God is giving and receiving. And so the, the, the church during any time of persecution goes back to giving and receiving. That's what they do. That's what they do. You just look out for the need, like it says in the book of Acts, you look out for the need. And people will help one another out. We won't need cash. We were reading, somebody we were reading on Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday, somebody read out where Jesus says, don't even take a money belt with you. I have never seen that scripture in the context of the last days, ever. But you see, there'll be a time when there won't be any money. <laughs> You'll have to be reliant upon people's love for one another. That's why we need to level up. Now. And Ahimelech had. Ahimelech was very strong in this area. He was a very, very godly man. Okay, then David answered the priest and so on. Well, okay, let's get to the, uh, the, the nasty man. So turn to verse 7. So in verse 7 we realise that there's somebody else in, in the sanctuary here. And this certain somebody, his name is Doag. And his name means fearful. And he's practically the head of the chief, chief police for Saul. And this is, what, this is what happens. It's satanic, actually. But the, Doeg just happens to be in the right place at the right time. Isn't that amazing? And it's how it happens sometimes, you know. Satan, I don't know how he does it, but this man is here when David is absolutely desperate. Ahimelech's helping him, and this man from the shadows is watching this transaction. So the transaction is this. 
David gets bread. His soldiers need bread. They need sustenance. David gets Goliath's sword. Now, there's two ways you can look at that. Some people believe it represents the word of God. Others believe it represents a worldly weapon. That David had gotten to that point where he was, he was beginning to fight a different way. I don't know. But he was also given guidance. And this man was watching from the shadows. He was watching. He was gathering. Listen. He was gathering data. He was gathering information. It, it, it's not real estate that's going to be king in the future. It's not land that's going to be king. It's data. And so he observed what David was doing and then I believe he put his own spin on it later. So David went into the sanctuary, he got bread off this compassionate priest, he got a weapon, he got guidance. Then he went from there to Gath. Get this, right? This shows you the state of David's mind. He believed he stood more of a chance living amongst the Philistines than he did amongst the people of God. That's insane. But that's the situation. And he pretended to be insane, actually, during that time. Then he went from there to the cave of Adullam. People came to him, all the battered, bruised, discontent, and in distress. They came to David. Then he went from there to the forest of Harith. And when he comes to the forest of Harith, we, in verse 6, we see that Saul is now completely paranoid. And um, Saul's beginning to lose it. And if we go to verse 8, 22 verse 8, it says, All of you, talking to his people, his servants, all of you have conspired against me. There is no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there is not one of you who is sorry for me. Or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Then Doag, this man that was hidden in the shadows, that gathered the data, that observed the situation. Doag the Edomite who was set over the servants of Saul, notice that. Said, oh I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob to Ahimelech the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and he gave him provisions, and he gave him Goliath's sword. Notice that he leaves that to last. Listen, you can, you can recount a story to somebody, and it's not what you say, it's how you say it. That's why texting's weird, because people, they struggle, they think, well, what does he mean by that? And how, how do I take that? So what... Doag is saying is true, but he kind of, he, 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 he changes the narrative by putting the last thing as being this weapon. In other words, yes, I saw him. He was helped out by Ahimelech. He was helped out by the priests and he was given a weapon. And the, the sense that, that David is getting ready to fight Saul is anything but the truth. David was not getting ready to fight Saul. David was running from Saul. But because Saul is paranoid, this is what paranoia does, there are always people that will feed into that paranoia. You see it all the way throughout history. Dictators are paranoid people. They have power, they get paranoid, and they've got these little imps around them that feed them with more paranoia to get their own way. Like Yes Minister. Anybody remember Yes Minister? Okay, let's go to verse 16. So now they round up these priests, Ahimelech. And the king said to Ahimelech, this guy that had such compassion upon David, you, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Then the king said to the guards who stood about him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord. Because their hand was also with David, and because they knew when he fled, and they did not tell it to me. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. That's amazing. And in persecution, there are mercy drops. There are people that should follow the chain of command, but they, they don't. 
they turn against him. Thank God you see that in persecution. And what you see here, and that this happens with every dictator, the dictator says, this is the enemy. And so all those cronies around him have to believe that that is the enemy. Of course we see the Jews would be the big example. This is the enemy. They're the rats of society. We have to rid the world of them. But you don't have to believe what a man says is the enemy. It's a big mistake. You have to believe what King Jesus says. He's the only one that we follow. When a man says this is the enemy, don't listen to them. Listen to Jesus. Listen only to Jesus. And they refuse to do it. They refuse to do it. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doag, so here's Doag, he's there, he's handy, he's waiting. You get the feeling that this guy actually likes to watch people die. Do you get that feeling? The Jews, they, they, they've done a big study on this guy. So Doag the Edomite turned and he struck the priests. And killed on that day 85 men. Who, were, who wore a linen ephod, also knob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword, both men and women and children and nurses, uh, nursing infants, oxen, donkeys, sheep, by the edge of the sword. And it tells us at the end of here that David says, I knew on that day when I was in that sanctuary, the minute I saw that man, I knew. I knew. Brother will betray brother. Brother will betray brother. And we are only as strong as the weakest link inside of us, friends. And when we're looking for physical hiding places, Jesus says, you're going to have to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. You're going to have to have eyes in the back of your head. Uh, Back in the Second World War, they listened to the radio. That was their version of prophecy updates. They listen to the radio to find out what's going on. You've got to put your ear to the train track and find out how far that train is away because it's coming. Then, in verse 23, and for time I'm going to just speed this. Then in verse 23, David's on the run again. And he hears that this Israeli village is being raided by the Philistines. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save uh, Kiliah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to Kiliah against the armies of the Philistines? So David inquired of the Lord again. So his own men are saying, We haven't got it, David. We're on the run. We're already fighting a battle, we're on the run. The last thing we need is another battle within a battle. So David says, okay guys, I'm going to go back to the Lord. He inquires of the Lord again. And when he inquires of the Lord again, the Lord says, yes, go. Go down. And so let's, let's, go, let's go down to verse 10. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Kilia to destroy the city for my sake. So he delivers Kilia. Saul finds out where he is. And David goes back to the Lord yet again. Saul never goes to the Lord in prayer. He just presumes everything. He just presumes that God has given David into his hand. Remember what Jesus said? They, they think they're doing God a favour. Will the men, so he asked, he asked the Lord, will the men of Kilia um, deliver me into his hand? So he's, uh, get this folks, this is crazy. He's asking God, will the men who I've just went, rescued betray me? Deliver me into the hand of Saul. And will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Oh Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said to him, he will come down. He will come down. Saul's coming after you. Do you understand how important prayer is? Do you understand how important it is that we are in touch with God? Then David said, Will the men of Kilia deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver you. That's insane. 
He's just rescued these people and they're going to turn him in. Now I use this to show you just how difficult it is to physically hide. Okay, now this is a long time ago. When you go, get to the times of the Jews and Stalin and what's going on in, in, uh, in um, China and, and, and the persecutions around the world, it's very, very, very difficult to physically hide. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. And in the midst of all the complications, you better make sure God is with you. Because if God isn't with you, folks, it's not going to work out. So I, I want you to see from Scripture, not from anything, from Scripture, when you're on the run and you're trying to physically hide, it ain't easy. Okay? So the second thing that we're going to look at is what happens when the physical hiding places no longer exist and we have to hide ourselves in the Lord. So turn, please, very quickly to Genesis 39. Genesis 39, Joseph had a coat, a beautiful coat given to him by his father that loved him dearly. Now that coat basically meant that he was in charge of his brothers. That's what it meant. So what do his brothers do? Notice this is not Pharaoh that's throwing him in the pit. It's not the, the typical baddie that's throwing him in the pit. Who's throwing Joseph in the pit? It's his own brothers. They throw him in the pit. There is no hiding place for Joseph. Does everybody understand? There's no physical hiding place for Joseph. But look at this. Verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. Verse 4. So Joseph found favour. Verse 21, when Potiphar, when he's, everything's happened with Potiphar and he's ran and he's ended up in jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Can you see that even when the physical hiding places have gone and the only thing that we can do is hide in God, what does God promise? I'll never leave you. I will never leave you. And God was with Joseph and God will be with his people. Have a look at Matthew chapter 11 verse 2. Matthew 11 verse 2 is John the Baptist. John the Baptist quite rightly called out Herod because Herod thought he was above the law. That's what happens. Power, that, power makes you think like that. Power makes you think, I'm talking about religious people now, not people in the world. Power makes you think that you are above the word of God. That it doesn't apply to you somehow. And so John called out Herod, quite rightly so. But he, pay, he paid the price for it. Now in Matthew 11 it says, and when John, this John's in prison. Okay, so there's no physical hiding place for John. He's in prison. And he was in there a long time, by the way. Much longer than you think. Uh, and of course that's when the doubts start creeping in, isn't it? And so John, this is John, fearless John. John had heard, um, when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent out two of his disciples saying to him, are you the coming one or shall we look for another? John was thinking that Jesus was going to come in power and chop down that tree, chop down the false religions and rid the Roman army. And he's like, this isn't the way I thought it was going to happen. And Jesus tells the people only when John's messages have gone what did you go out in the wilderness to see a reed shaken by the wind John was no reed shaken by the wind oh he, listen John had his moments of doubt and so did Elijah so do many people in the Bible by the way we all do it's natural but he saw his calling out to the very end he completed his calling and and Jesus said there's no man born of woman greater than this man but I want you to see, there comes a time when there are no physical hiding places. It, it, it's, it's, it's very naive to think that that's always going to be the way. There comes a point where the only hiding place, place is God himself. And Jesus commends uh, John. Have a look at Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, fantastic. Again, uh, Paul and Silas, they'd set a demon-possessed girl free from a, a spirit of divination. You think they, they get a pat on the back and a picture on the front spread of their Christian denominational magazine. You know, there they are. Look what they've done. It was a marvellous miracle. No, they were flogged and they were put into prison. 
But in verse 25, we, we get a little glimpse of Paul and Silas. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. That's incredible. We, we take that for granted. Why were they praying and singing hymns? I would suggest to you they're praying and singing hymns because that's what they've always done. Yeah. That's, their, that's their habit. It's the same as Daniel. Why did Daniel carry on praying when the edict was, you can't pray to any god anymore? Why did he carry on praying? Because it was his habit. And so it's absolutely essential that we are a praying people and a praising people. If we're not praying and praising now, why would we be then? It doesn't work that way. So it's so important. And he says, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. <laughs> Even their weakest link was strong. And the prisoners were listening. Isn't that amazing? The prisoners were listening. You know, what did the prisoners, I'm talking about the unsaved now, what did the prisoners hear when we're in a situation like that? Oh, I'm sick of this. This person has done this to me and I'm meaning him. And the prisoners are listening and thinking, is there any power in this Christianity? What's it all about? All they ever seem to do is whinge. But the prisoners heard them singing and praising the Lord. It's so important. And of course, they were set free. Have a look at Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Uh, in Acts chapter 12. Verse 5, Peter falls asleep. He's in prison. And that Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. That's, this is how it should be. This is how it should be. That whole um, Doag thing is sickening to the core. And that is, unfortunately, you've all seen it. You've all seen it in your own way in church. You, already you've seen it. Uh, you imagine what those people would be like in a time of persecution. Imagine that's what they're like when they've got bread on the table, when they've got food, when they've got shelter, when they've got everything going for them. Now imagine that person in hell, in somewhere like Ravensbrook. Well, this, this here is a picture of how it should be. Paul's in prison and the people of God are praying it through. That's how it should be. This is how it should be. Even their weakest link was strong. Okay, have a look at Philippians. People forget that when Paul wrote Philippians, he wrote it from prison. Peter was delivered from prison. Some people do get delivered. Remember Betsy's wonderful dream, Corrie and Betsy? Betsy had a lovely dream. She was so sick. She'd been beaten black and blue. Um, and she was dying. And she dreamt. She said, Corrie... I've dreamt, the Lord has shown me, neither you nor I will be in this place in Ravensbrook when New Year comes. We'll be out of here. And, and it, it came true. The Lord took Betsy. Death became Betsy's hiding place. And the Lord delivered Corrie and she went around the world telling people there is no pit that is that deep that the Lord cannot shine his light. Philippians 1.12 Philippians 1.12, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Where did he write this from? Prison. Even Paul's weakest link was strong. Even his weakest link was strong. This has turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I, I remember Danny, who got MS, uh, paralyzed from the neck downwards, some of you helped him to go to church and prayed for him regularly. He had no life, that fella. And I can remember going and seeing him once. We used to have to winch him up, didn't we, in a wheelchair and put him down in, into another wheelchair. Take him to, it was a really big ordeal. He never complained. Even when I lost control of the wheel, wheelchair at one time, actually lost control and he's going down the road going, ah! And he, he smashed into this sign and cut all his hand up. I was like, I'm really sorry, Danny, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but that man never complained. All he ever said, all he ever said is, this has happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel. Danny's, Danny's weakest link was strong. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible people. You have to understand that when we read one of the most beautiful parts in all the scripture, let this mind be in you that's also in Christ Jesus. 
that he humbled himself even to the point of the cross that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Where does all that come from? It comes from prison. He wrote that in prison. Even Paul's weakest link was strong. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. 2 Timothy 4 verse 5. We were talking this week, Viv and Ray were in, one or two others were in, and we were talking about the last days and whatnot. And as Viv and Ray walked out, this, is the, this scripture just came to me. 2 Timothy 4 verse 5, But you keep your head in all things. But you, you keep your head. Keep your head. Don't let your head start spinning. Keep your head in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's what we're here for. We have to keep our head, no matter what happens, and fulfill our ministry. Amen? Amen. Okay, praise the Lord. See how quickly I've gone through that. So now we're going to look, finally, at when death itself becomes a hiding place. We've looked at physical hiding places, we've looked at when we're hidden in Christ, now we're going to look at when death itself becomes a hiding place. Have a look at Psalm um, 116, Psalm 116, Psalm 116, death is not a shameful thing for the Christian, you do realise that's false doctrine, right? When you hear this, continually hear this thing that somehow it's a shameful thing for a Christian to die and no, no, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible teaches that the minute you die, you enter into Christ's presence. To live is die, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And this, this, this doctrine, which basically says if we die, somehow we're a loser, is ridiculous. The Bible says it's appointed for man to die once. We're all going to die, folks. It's part of it. We've got to, what's up with us? You know, now, I, I say that, I struggle with it as much as anybody else. It's probably why I, I, I talk about it so much. But the, the thing is, is this, we've got to get our heads around this. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. It's precious. That means rare. It means weighty. Precious. Have a look at 1 Thessalonians 4. When people talk about 1 Thessalonians 4, they always talk about the rapture. Always the blinking rapture. Praise the Lord for the rapture, by the way. Wonderful. Hallelujah. What an event that's going to be. But we miss something. We miss it. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. We never talk about those that have fallen asleep. It's always about the rapture. It's always about, and we're the generation that's going to see the rapture, and we're going to go up in it. Every generation has said that. You do understand that, right? And every generation has fallen asleep. Most people fit into category number one. But they're still going to make the rapture because the dead in Christ go up first. Then those are alive. We still make it, just, you know, in a different way. But we have to understand this. Falling asleep is a hiding place. That's what Kari said about her sister. She won't be able... To, no more will they stand her outside in the freezing cold for two, three hours. No more will they whip her to the point that she's almost dead. She's hidden. She's hidden in Christ. Death itself becomes a hiding place. Precious in the sight of the Lord. Maybe not in our sight. Maybe we think, oh, you know, oh, dear, dear. You know... Not in God's eyes. He doesn't see the way we see. It's very precious. Very precious when a born again Christian goes to be with him. It's a precious event. Don't underestimate the power, what this means when it says they're asleep. It's resting, folks. We're going to rest. You know, the switch is going to be flicked. There's coming a time when all this stuff that's in our heads about iniquity, transgression, violence... The things that are going on around the world, both the sin in the world and the sin in us, when that happens, God flicks that switch, we will be free, totally set free from all that. We'll be at rest. And that's how most are going to go. Most are going to fall asleep. That's just it. John chapter 11, John chapter 11, John chapter 11, verse 11, John 11, 11. John 11, 11. Jesus says this, our friend, our friend, he's not just your, he's not just your brother, he's our friend, he's our friend, I love him, 
Well, what's he doing? If he looked, why is he allowing him to die? That's ridiculous. How can you be my friend if you're allowing me to die? Well, I look, folks, it, when we look back from eternity, we will not see the times that we suffered. We won't remember them. When a woman finally gets that baby in her hands, she doesn't remember the labour pains. I kept on saying to Jane, Jane, when you finally get that husband, you won't be thinking about all the time that you were single. It's as though it never happened. That's how it is. That's how it is. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. You understand? It's glorious. It's, he's my friend. Jesus says he's my friend. He's sleeping. But I'm going to wake him. And I can imagine Lazarus thinking, what on earth are you bringing me back to this dump for? To be persecuted all over again, by the way. Yeah. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 verse 32. Let me, let me get through this. I'm doing well for time. Hebrews 11. Let me read this, because it's just beautiful, this is. Uh, Hebrews 11 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and... Samson and Jephthah, also of David, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the, the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of markings, of scourgings, yes, of chains, imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain, they were uh, with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. The world was not worthy of these people. No wonder the Lord took them. The world was not worthy of them. They get to rest. Of whom the world is not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and in the caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect except with us. Do you understand what this means? This means that there's a reunion coming in heaven. When the dead in Christ... And those that are caught up are gathered together in the heavens. And folks, it's going to be glorious. You know when, when Joseph had a, a reunion with his brothers, what a messed up dysfunctional family that was. But God loved them, you know. He loved them. And when they came together and Joseph wept, and all of them were wrong in some area or another. What happened when they had that reunion? Did they all fall out and start punching one another? No. Joseph says, come with me. I've prepared this place for you. All of this is for you. Come with me. That's how it's going to be in the reunion. In that reunion in heaven, you're going to see people that you didn't even get on that well with. Christians that you didn't even get on that well with. But guess what? You will not be the same person and neither will they. You will bear the image of the man of heaven. Yeah. You'll be rid of everything that's wrong and so will they. And they will be your brother and sister. And, and it, it, it's hard for us to understand but there's coming a reunion so don't worry. Don't worry. You know what you have to do? What, what I have to do? We have to forgive people in our hearts now. Make sure there's nothing in us now. And sometimes the Lord opens the door for restoration. Sometimes it doesn't happen. But there's going to be a reunion in heaven. Those that are sleeping and those that are caught up. It's going to be incredible. Okay. I've got um, a few minutes to look at this. Have a look at Genesis chapter 5 just for a minute. Okay. The, now. Oh. Who's heard of the baby boomers? The baby boomers. So the baby boomers are the longest living generation for hundreds of years. Yeah? Hundreds of years. There's never been a generation that's lived as long as this generation. They are a special generation, actually. Because this generation have seen, I believe, something of what a godly 
country looks like, as best as it can look in a fallen world anyway. The beginning of the baby boomers, you had people queuing up outside churches for national days of prayer under a godly king. We can't even imagine that today, can we? The baby boomers went to Sunday school, they went to church, they could quote the Psalms, generally speaking, of course, I'm talking generally here. You went to schools, you didn't go to school and not hear the Bible, you, you sung hymns, this was their generation. And it is, it is alarming to think that within the next 10 years or so, this generation will have gone. They'll have gone. Now, in Genesis 5, there's a genealogy. I'm not going to go into it all because of time. But the last three names are Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Noah means rest. Rest. Lamech means his death shall bring. The longest living generation. When, that, when Methuselah dies, something changes. Lamech means despair, hopelessness, despair. I think in many ways the Queen, whatever you think of her as a person, I'm not being political, I'm just stating a point. The Queen represents that era of a time in this nation where we really were, as much as a secular nation can be, we were a Christian nation. And when she died, wasn't it strange that there were so many rainbows? Did you not think that that was a bit odd? Rainbows everywhere. Because it's coming to an end. It's coming to an end. I've seen so many godly, godly men. I'll, David Pawson would be a good example. 90 odd years of age when he passed. But what a man of God. The things that that man has seen, friends. Have you noticed that God is taking people? He's taking them. He's taking them. He's taking them. And there are people in this room right now that God is going to take. He's going to take you. You're going to sleep in him. Please don't fear it. God loves you. He's taking you because he loves you, because there's something coming upon this earth that he doesn't want you to see. And he'll take you through death. Death itself will become the hiding place for you. And this baby boomer generation, they're nearly up. They're nearly up. You see, Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means despair. Listen, when that generation goes and there are no people anymore that can reference a godly time. Can you imagine that? That can reference a godly time. Europe, particularly in the West, we will be plunged into something. And I want to say this, this is important. You, if you're part of that generation, I'm speaking to you right now. It's not for you to shut your mouth when the younger ones tell you that this is how it is. The Lord never changes, it's the same yesterday, today and forever. You keep on telling them what it was like. They might not listen, they probably won't listen, but there'll come a time when despair comes upon this earth, when they realise that what grandma and granddad, what mum and dad said about this place, they would pine for that. They would pine for a time when you could actually have fellowship with other Christians. They would pine for a time when there's actual liberty and you can make your own decisions in life. They would pine for a time when there was such purity that people didn't actually have sex before they were married. They will pine for that because this world is spiralling out of control. And when the Methuselah generation disappears, despair will descend upon this planet. And the only thing that will be left is a remnant. Just a remnant. And if it's not for God, and I, let me tell you this now, if it is not for God, we'd become like dodos. If it, if it was not for God, Christianity would become extinct. There's a massive falling away coming and it's gathering momentum all the time. And if it's not for God, there wouldn't even be a remnant. Let me show you in closing Isaiah 55 verse 1. Isaiah 55 verse 1. The righteous perishes. Notice that? 
and no man takes it to heart. We don't even understand how precious it is to the Lord. Merciful men are taken away and no one considers. The righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in uprightness. Do you see this? He takes them and he is taking them. And sometimes we transfix so much upon the rapture that we forget those that will sleep, those that will be taken even before the rapture. He's going to take them. He is taking them. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9. Three o'clock Friday morning. Well, Saturday morning. This scripture came to my mind. I've never really ever meditated upon this scripture ever before. But this is what it says. Unless, Isaiah 1 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant. Notice who it is that brings about this remnant. It's not us, it's God's doing, it's His work. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, what would we have become like? Sodom and Gomorrah. How many people survived Sodom and Gomorrah? None. Unless the Lord brings about a remnant, once that Methuselah generation is gone, there will be no one. God will and is right now raising a remnant. And you are only, and I am only as strong as the weakest link inside of us. Okay. One Kings, one Kings. 19 verse 18 this is really important Elijah sat on the top of Mount Carmel when he was out and completely outnumbered notice he was completely outnumbered who is Elijah is a foreshadow of the uh, the two witnesses to come three and a half years the whole thing parallel it's a picture of the last days he's on top of Carmel and he's totally outnumbered totally outnumbered that's the way it's going to be. And he says, I, I, I'm the only one. That's what he says. Now in 1 Kings 19, verse 14, he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord of God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. Get this. This is not even Elijah. Elijah was probably the leader of this whole kind of remnant thing. Not even Elijah himself knew where the remnant was. He had no idea that God was raising up a people for that very hour. Listen, it's God's work. That should this morning really encourage you. It is God's work. And he's raising up a people. The most unlikely people. Not who you think. It's not going to be who you think. There will be people that you think will do well and they'll crumble. There are others that you think they don't stand a chance and they'll excel. It's going to be full of surprises. But God knows who they are. And this is what it says. 1 Kings 19, 18. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all those who have not... Who has reserved? There's no man involved in this, friends. This is not man's work. Unless the Lord had brought about a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the hand of God Almighty. And he's raising a remnant. Revelation chapter 6, we're, we're, we're done almost this morning. Revelation chapter 6. There are two phases. There are two phases coming. The first phase is the Lord will take you. Okay? And you'll sleep in Him. You can call it the Methuselah generation if you like. The Lord will take you. The second phase is martyrdom. Either way, either way, Death becomes the ultimate hiding place. Do you get that? Let me show you. 
Verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls that had been slain. They're hidden by the altar. They're hidden by the cross. They're hidden by the shadow of the Almighty, by the blood of Jesus. They're hidden under the altar. They're slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. They cry out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, will you avenge our blood of those who dwell on the earth? They're given a, a white robe and they're given... It's given to each other. And it was said to them that they should rest. Notice that. What is it they're doing? They're resting. They're, they're asleep. They're in a hiding place, folks. They're resting. A little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. And I looked. And when he opened the sixth seal, this is it, folks. I tell you, look, there's, there's going to come a time where the, the, some kind of totalitarian state will rise. It'll have a figurehead. And they will hunt down every single person on this planet. They'll hunt, they'll hunt, they'll hunt. But th 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 it ain't over there. That's not where it finishes. Remember, remember Psalm 139. Not even darkness can hide from God. Not even darkness. And so everything changes here. I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The hair of the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as late fig trees drops its late figs when it was shaken by a mighty wind. Then the skies receded as a scroll which is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves. Who are they hiding from here? They're not hiding from the persecutors, they're hiding from God. And here's the problem, there is nowhere to hide. They hid themselves in the mountains and they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne and of the wrath of the Lamb. Fall on us, hide us somehow. Who from? There's nowhere to hide. It is God who has the ultimate surveillance system. It's God that's searching the hearts and reins of every person on this planet. It's God that's done a full data readout on all of us. It's God that knows us, body, soul and spirit, thought, word and deed. It's God that sees us beyond the subatomic level. It's his spirit that's searching out every man, woman and child on this planet. And there's nowhere to hide. And during the Second World War, when the... Uh, um, when they freed Germany and they came in to the death camps, the SS officers were taking off their, 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 their uniforms as quick as they could. Trying to hide the fact that they had committed so many terrible atrocities. That had hunted down people in the most cruel, vindictive ways known to man. And they take off those uniforms thinking, we're going to get away with this. Maybe we can get out to South America, who knows? Well, on that day, there's not one single soul that have persecuted even the fingernail of a, of a, of a believer. They're not going to get away with it. There is nowhere to hide from God. God will have his vengeance Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I constantly think about Germany. Did they ever really get their comeuppance? It's going to happen. It'll happen. In God's timing, it'll happen. Let's just go back to Psalm 139 together and just read it in a worshipful way, friends. And just let's understand who and what a mighty God it is that we serve this morning. O oh Lord, you have searched me, you have known me, you know my sitting down, you know my rising up, you understand my thoughts from afar, you comprehended my path and my lying down, you are acquainted with all of my ways, for there is not a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether, you have hedged me behind and before, you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall batter me, crush me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. Amen.